think I wasn't competitive. Eugen, oh! It already looked good and it was such a simple concept. Oh, that hurts! Got, got the phone call, thought it was mad. Time under the mountain, scrambles, it's one of his trademarks to the front. Oh, he's caught the hand, he's caught the hand! Like, they pulled these doors open. You've got 20 seconds, let's go. And that's the only reason I'm competing. Why are you competing to come second? You're not. You're competing to come first, right? You want to win. In comes I Richard this, Thompson. This is this is wild. How, how do I even get my head around this? And like, there's this massive warehouse that we never knew was there. We used to do a lot of tag. Someone had a like a GoPro, and um. We just thought, let, let's um, test the GoPro out and film one of our games of tag. And um, so we put the helmet on and then we just started playing tag in the garden. And it just kind of shows how, how the sport has sort of evolved, really. Can you explain to me the basic rules of a chase tag match? Basically, there's two teams of up to five or six athletes, depending on the tournament. Each chase lasts 20 seconds. One person is the chaser and one person is the evader. And the chaser has to try and tag the evader and the evader has to try and not get caught. And whoever wins stays on as the evader. That's the most important thing. Um, so the winner always stays on as the evader. And um, if the evader can last 20 seconds without getting caught, then they get a point. And each match is basically the best of 16 chasers. One of the things that I noticed as a viewer is the sort of array of names that different obstacles have. We do a, we do a clockwise, we do a, a, cl a clockwise overview of all of the obstacles. So you've got the front line. Um, people can just jump straight from a chase plate over the front line, which is like a six foot jump, about three foot up. Um, which is quite impressive. Come across uh, the sisters, which are two boards that you can take off of the first one and jump the second one, or you can do a double Kong or a dive Kong, uh, which is when you like slap with your hands and your bum comes up in the air. After the sisters, you get to the back line, and this first obstacle in the back left is where a lot of the evaders will start. It's called the Tilted Cube. Again, the tilted cube providing a lot of protection. It is also one of the highest places for people to get tagged. Come around the back line, which puts you underneath the mountain, which is this big structure at the back with two big boards and a big flat board at the front. All the way at the back, we've got the loading bay. This is the back right. You're going to hit the ridge, which is a really high wall. It's probably the, the most likely uh, obstacle to clip your knees on. Do you have a breakdown of what makes a really good or bad chase? I think the definition of a good chase is the number of, of interesting interactions, probably. Chases have a certain kind of dynamic. We kind of look at them as like interactions and then a chases. So the first four seconds of a chase is just the chaser getting towards the evader. Then there's an interaction. And then, and then there's an interaction, either he gets caught or he moves on to another part of the court, and then there's another interaction. So there is a kind of dynamic to a chase. There's a kind of Just interaction, so then a pursuit, interaction, pursuit, interaction, pursuit, you know? We have a term called EQ, which is like evasion quality. And that's like probably the most important thing to remember to do with the courts. So if it's a low EQ area, there's not much protection. If it's a high EQ area, there's a lot of protection. And then we realized the more obstacles we sort of put in the court, we realized it got more interesting the more obstacles there were. Then we realized actually parkour people are probably going to be the best athletes to play because there's so many obstacles. What is going on in this clip? I'm coming up super high so I can reach above the bar, not just grab it with my fingertips. I'm actually grabbing it with bent arms. Then I can load all the weight onto my lats, transfer underneath the bar with a swing up to the other side of the bar for the 180, 
grab the bar again, so I've obviously had to let go of it to do the 180. And then once I've grabbed, I'm re-engaging all of uh, my like active shoulder movement. So lats, a lot of shoulders like pulling in, and then being able to spot where I'm going and throw my hips up above the space that I'm gonna land on, and then land on the balls of my feet, which is like a must with parkour because if you land anywhere on the box, you could slip. If you land on the edge, you've actually got something to push against. And it needs to be the balls of your feet because if you land on your toes, you'll slip. And if you land in the middle, it will hurt. And if you land on the heels, you could slip. So it has to be this, this part of your, your foot that's strong. You're reminding me of in those Guy Ritchie, Sherlock Holmes movies when Holmes gets in some sort of situation. <laughs> Count with cross to left cheek. The whole point of parkour, like the philosophy behind it, is basically like self-control and understanding of your body and understanding of your surroundings and stuff like that. How is the parkour world organized into these teams? What are teams? So all these brands came about as, yeah, just groups of young lads who were training together often, having fun, and wanting to try and make a living off of it. That first time that you tried World Chase Tag, do you remember how that felt or what you thought? Yeah, I was really tired. <laughs> He's coming underneath the sisters. Was that tag? No, Rich is still in pursuit. He's managed to go underneath for Rich. Rich is going on. Oh! I was like, this is really tiring. Um, but as a parkour athlete, you're used to doing like lines that are like really, really short and explosive, right? And you have a preset route. Like you don't just run around as people think like on roofs and like do anything. You don't do that. Everything's pre thought out. Everything's tested. Everything's like, I know what I can do. With this, it's like, ah, it's totally like instinctual for at first, because obviously when you first have a play, you don't think about tactics. You're just like, okay, just run. <laughs> like, you know? And obviously like you play the first game, you're like, oh, okay. There's the first two, three games. You're like, oh, okay, there's some strategy to this. You're familiar with in like um, any ball sport, you get duking. So you'd go like, you're going up to a player and you, you divert. So it looks like you're going to go one way and you go the other way. That's like a really obvious, like we use duking. Idling is a great time, but it's when you, you've got an obstacle between you and another person. So there's an impasse and you look like you're moving, but you're not. So you're just, you're on the balls of your feet. You're almost, it's like a, an engine is running and then it, it explodes and that's, it's the build up. It's a crescendo before the like great drop on the music. Games. Wait to see, look at that, yeah. Goading him on, giving him a little bit of hands. Oh, but there's a mental torture almost of like antagonizing somebody and getting them frustrated so you know what they're gonna do, you know? Like telegraphing something is something that's really, really important. I think that fighting is a really, really similar. Mountain, this could be a first point. Eugen, oh! What can you tell me about this idea of hurting? One of the techniques would be called shepherding, and I think I'm safe to say that that's quite well known. Yeah, I've, I've been using herding. You just classed it up, like 20%. <laughs> shepherding, yeah. Yeah. But it, it, but it, yeah, I mean, the name says it. It's sort of like, you're doing this, you're doing this, and you're keeping them in a corner. And it's like having control over where they are, because you're almost like, you're at their mercy if you're following them around religiously. Whereas if you are shepherding them and keeping them into a corner, you have control in that situation. Upsteps, Haroon Hanafi. Haroon herds perfectly. Now nobody has ever managed to successfully evade Haroon in the history of World Chase Tag. Reverse herd is really, really tricky to do. Um, and it's basically to keep your eyes on the opponent as an evader and run them through high EQ obstacles while they're chasing you. And I know it's something he's worked on because I've talked to him, but I'm friends with him and he's uh he basically points steps up goes up to the mountain drops down Haroon pointing one way going the other a trademark of his being a chaser used to be easier it's now made it a little bit harder because they they talk about eq evasion quality uh, quite a lot and they're trying to increase that what they want to do is they want to keep the eq at 25 percent so i used to love chasing because i thought it was really really easy and i could get it done but for like pure glory, evasions are like how you get points, right? Like evasion is how you get a point and how you get it done. So I love that the most. We always used to play in the open garden. 
And then、right. I remember the day, the first time the obstacles kind of came into it.、Um, Christian had cut the hedge, and we started to play around the hedge clippings. And that was the first time we thought, actually, that's pretty. That's pretty good. So、yeah. the, it was running based. So if you were fast and agile, then you would dominate. Then when we introduced the bench, it was quite a low bench. You had to go over the bench. So it was a different skill. Yeah, we started in the garden. Then we started a meetup group. Come on, once it got to winter, people were sliding. It was muddy and it was raining. So we moved into a gym that called our Parko Generations. That was、um, the the first Parko gym that opened up in like in London. They had much better obstacles, so we started to like do that. But they were just boxes and bars. We bought、um, some scaffolding, and we basically made our own quad. And this was the definite watershed moment for us because we knew it was fun. This video of you guys, this is maybe my favorite footage that I've ever received from a source of you guys debating the placement. Of the bars in, in your in your back garden. I reckon the good thing about it is that again the EQ. For start, there's going to be no thing around here. You'll help the chaser to stop Benny Hill if the bar is here within sort of actually, foot height. Actually, the bar there. Yeah, that's the thing. You actually don't want that bar there because it might help them come up here. But what the chaser would do is that if someone flies through from into this hole, and you're the suppose suppose, suppose you we've had that conversation a million times. So we just then had to refine the rules, and then we just been refining the quad, and then just refining it, refining it as we go along. I don't think it's a big priority. It's going to be a hassle to do it. Let's,、um, let's, you know. I think I, I, I don't know. I'll have to measure it up and do it. But yeah, I could put one there. What is your name and what is your primary occupation in the world of sports commentary? I'm Dan Dawson. I've ridiculously, accidentally ended up with this sort of moniker of Dan Darts Dawson. International Darts Open, the final European Tour event of the year, has just played out, and it's been won by this man, the rock star Joe Cullen. And it is a heartbreaker for Franz Ruge. Andy Hamilton with a nine darter. And so you're sort of put in this interesting position because you have all this knowledge about darts in the darts world, but then. Suddenly, you have to become obsessed with world chase tag in a very short period of time. Somebody I'd worked with on the darts、um, had got in touch, just bunged me a speculative email saying, "Look, I'm I'm doing a doing this thing. It's like a it's it's like a sport, but it's like like tag, you know, like the playground game." And then as soon as I I googled it and had a look, like I was I was blown away. I was aware of parkour, but only like when I was a teenager. I think when it all sort of started happening, there were these impossibly cool French guys going,、uh, "Parkour, it's a, it's a philosophy. It is not a sport. It is a way of life."、Um, and I remember people just running around as a teenager, like jumping on walls and stuff, a bit like the sort of、uh, the American office geezer who just runs around shouting parkour. Parkour. And then to see this turned into an actual competitive sport was was cool, but I, I was I still wasn't prepared for when I actually got down there on the day. He cannot get hold of him. Back round the loaded by slip. And that... I mean, look at me. I walked into that place, and they all looked like Greek gods. I was like, <laughs> I was like Jabba the Hutt being surrounded by like three dozen Luke Skywalkers somersaulting all over the place. Like they, that is not my natural habitat. But、uh, to go in there and just try and learn, but speaking to Damien and Christian about how they came up with the game and the concept, Connor was invaluable when I was working with him. Just to try, yeah, I got him to just walk me round the quad. Over the sisters, round towards his front line, looking to cut down the angle and does so and lands on top of Ben Ten. You see him just land on top of him. That is crazy play. He had to make up for lost time from a small slipper early on. He's managed to run, chase him down across the front line and get down on top of the other player. I'm, I'm learning. Learning as much as anybody else about this, it's a new sport for everybody to get their head around. What makes you the people who are in the rain, assembling the scaffolding, debating the placement of a bar? What what drives this obsession for you? 
I wanted to see the best people chase. And I, I, I really hope there's a day where people are, you know, at the age of eight, they get into chase tag and they just train the whole time. And I'd love to see them when they're 25 or 28 at the yeah. peak of their physical condition, training awesome. against other people who have also trained since they were eight. I will go to sleep at night, some nights, like when I'm really like preparing for a competition, like thinking about roots and lines and things. I go like down a rabbit hole. You think in your head, your your little vision of yourself, you go, yeah, I can do, I can do all of that. Absolutely all of it. And then you realize that you can't even carry your washing upstairs without tripping over the cat or something. When we do parkour, we say we're training. Like we're training, like what are we training for? And I suppose you could say it was a situation in which you're chasing or evading someone. So it's almost like world chase tag is like the thing that we are preparing ourselves for. I start describing how the sport works and as I'm describing it, I get like a feedback loop of, man, this sounds really good. I'd love to watch this. You just see how similar like we all are, regardless of actually where we're from, you know, and this is this is a really interesting element for me that, that all humans could be united by this one activity that they all do. It's a giant skull in the background. Do you want skull or no skull? <laughs> Skull's fine. <laughs> At the time when lockdown first happened, we were sort of tentatively talking about having quite a few events. I think we had a European championship sort of penciled in. We had a potential event in Saudi Arabia penciled in. We also had an Amer we, um, what was going to be the world championships in America. And then as soon as lockdown came up, we just realized that, was, you know, none of that was going to happen. Our final decision, which is sort of encouraged by the investors that we have at the moment, they said, OK, let's do a US national event. And that's what we ended up doing in October in Atlanta. Another thing that, like, w that came positive out of the lockdown what happened in the UK was we got really good weather and normally when we have the quad up we only put the quad up for events so we have we book a space we put the quad up and that's the only time me and Damien get to sort of see it up and we could never use it because all the athletes want to train on it so during lockdown when we had the good weather we decided to put the quad up it's the first time we done it so for us we had more time on the quad than we've ever had before.